Part 1. Miss Wang is going to register for her first year social science course. As you listen, fill in the gaps numbered 1 to 6. First you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. I'm here to register for the first year social science course. I'll just have to fill out this form for our records. What's your name? It's Wang Pearl. Excuse me? Is Pearl your last name? No, it's my first name. My family name is Wang. Can you spell that? Sure. Pearl. P-E-A-R-L. Wang is spelled W-A-N-G. OK, Pearl Wang. What's your address? It's 4832 Kent Road. Can you please repeat that? Kent, K-E-N-T, 4832 Kent Road, flat number 301. All right, and your telephone number? I haven't got the phone on yet. I'm still looking for an accommodation, which should be somewhere near the school. OK, well... Please let me have the number once the phone is connected, and I'll make a note here to be advised. And your course? First year social science course. Social science course. May I have the timetable? Yes, here it is. You'll have Dr Hill's lectures at 9.30 Monday morning, and also Thursday morning at 10.30. How long do they last? An hour. Which room are they in? The Monday morning lectures take place in room 101. The Thursday ones are in room 215. Thank you. Pearl wants to find an accommodation near her school. She saw an advertisement in the local newsagents and telephoned immediately. As you listen to her phone call, answer the questions by circling the correct letter. First, look at the questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the phone call and answer questions 7 to 10. Four six seven nine three one. Sue Jones speaking. Oh, hello. My name is Pearl Wang. I'm ringing about the flat. Oh, yes. You saw my ad in the newsagent's window, did you? That's right. Could you tell me something about the flat? Well, this is a two-bedroom flat. One big room and one a bit smaller. But it's quite nice. The rent is more than I could afford, so I've decided to find someone to share the flat with me. Oh, I see. May I have my own bathroom? Yes, there are two bathrooms. There's quite a big sitting room and a kitchen. The flat is an upstairs flat, on the top floor of the house. You know the landlady lives downstairs. And the central heating is there? Yes, gas central heating. Um, what about the rent? How much is it exactly? Well, I pay £90 a week. £90? Yes. But I thought I would pay £50 and ask the other person to pay 40 because, you know, uh, I've got the big bedroom. That seems only fair. I suppose so. What do you do? Work at the Globe Travel Agency. I'm from Australia and came here three months ago. What about you? What do you do? I'm studying, actually, at the Polytechnic Social Science. I'm from China. Sounds interesting. Look, why don't you come round and see the flat? Then you can make up your own mind. It's better than trying to talk about it over the phone. Yes. Mm, may I come round and see it in the afternoon? Well, actually, it's a bit difficult for me this afternoon. I've got to go out. How about this evening? At about seven o'clock? Yes, seven would be fine for me. Um, what's the address? 27 Park Road. Oh, I know Park Road. It's quite near where I study. See you tonight. Goodbye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear the president of Australia Retailers Association give his welcome address at a convention. First, you have some time to read questions eleven to fourteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to fourteen. Could I have your attention for a few minutes, please? Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Norman Flagstaff, President of Australia Retailers Association. On behalf of the organising committee for our third annual retailers convention, I'd like to welcome you all. Some of whom come as far as Brisbane and Melbourne to this wonderful convention centre in our fair capital, Canberra, and hope you make most of your stay. We have been very lucky with the weather, and I sincerely hope that it keeps up for the rest of the week, and maybe even the following. No, <laughs> I'm sure we won't be that lucky. <laughs> I'm pleased to announce that we have received a record number of registrations for this year's week-long convention. For the first five days, we will be hosting more than 250 participants for the lecturers and workshops. And hopefully, up to 300 will be coming for the following two days of commercial demonstrations. Another first is we have a record number of speakers, up from 20 last year to 25 this year, as well as having three guest speakers from abroad, who I'm sure will provide us with a great deal of information of how business is conducted in Britain, and also, I think it's the United States, is it? No, no, sorry, Canada. You'll note that we will be able to offer other overseas speakers in the next few years from different countries. Now you have a chance to read questions fifteen to twenty. As the talk continues, answer questions fifteen to twenty. For those of you who won't attend the lunchtime meeting, there are plenty of places to go. The famous Italian restaurant Peroni's is not too far from the convention centre. From the centre's entrance on King Street, just go straight to the street to the Mime Park. Through the Heroes Arch at the other end of the park, cross William Street, and it's right next to the bank. The Jumbo Sandwich Shop for quick snacks is also nearby. From the centre, just turn right up King Street and turn left into Queen Street. Go along Queen Street until you get to the William Street, then turn right. You'll spot it right next to the William Street Underground Station. Slim's Vegetarian is also nearby. Just turn left as you leave the centre into King Street. Cross over Elizabeth Street, and it's on your left, directly opposite the church. Finally, the Geneva Bistro is always popular place this area. It's located behind the church on William Street. Please make sure you're back on time, though. We don't want to finish too late. On the second part of the day, I'm afraid we will make a few amendments to the program. It's important to note that the afternoon session will begin at 2:30 p.m. and will be finished at the time indicated on your program. There have also been a couple of venue changes. The first being the talk on marketing by Jane Howard, which one now will be held in the green room on the second floor. The workshop on distribution of goods will not be given by Sarah Moore, but by her sister Barbara, due to an unforeseen illness in the red room on the second floor. We hope she'll be back on her feet in no time. It's good of Barbara to step in right at the last minute. Finally. The workshop on advertising by Peter Newstead has been cancelled due to an airline dispute. On Friday, we'll be starting off the day with a new video presented by the Dow Keys Company, as part of their opening lecture on merchandising. That's Friday, the twenty seventh. That's all for the moment. If you require any further information regarding the convention, you can talk to one of the many convention helpers wearing a distinctively blue and gold jackets. One thing before I finish: if there are any problems with times and locations of the day's activities, please remember that there is a notice board on the first. Is it the first? Yes, the first floor. 
Now, we hope you enjoy yourselves and we look forward to seeing you again. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between John Watson and several environmental science students. Now you. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce our guest to you, John Watson. We're delighted to have John with us today to share his views on conservation. As environmental science students, I know you'll have a lot of questions. So, let's kick off by asking him to tell us how he got involved in the environmental movement. Thank you, Deborah. It's nice to be here. When I was seven years old, back in the 1940s, my father bought 200 acres of land on the central coast of New South Wales in eastern Australia. The marvellous thing about it was that it was virgin bush, in other words, completely natural. But this kind of country doesn't exist anymore. Oh, what do you mean by that? Well, let me explain. We went to live there when I was ten. When I was twelve, the foxes and cats appeared. And by the time I was fourteen, there were no native animals left. You mean that within four years, all the native animals had gone? That's exactly what I mean. But it took a while for people to realise what was going on. So you're saying that it was the cat and the fox that killed off the native animals? Absolutely right. But back in the 1970s, people didn't realise it. Even though Australia was losing wildlife faster than the rest of the world combined, people were blaming the farmers and miners, but not their lovely little pussycats. Their domestic cats you're talking about? Exactly. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. What's more, they didn't want to know. Can you tell us how you set about proving your theory that it was feral cats and foxes which were killing native animals? Well, I moved to South Australia specifically to set up a wildlife sanctuary there. Why South Australia in particular? I chose South Australia because it was the only state where it was still legal for me to fence off an area and put back locally extinct animals. That was very far-sighted of them, wasn't it? Well, not exactly. They just hadn't got around to making it illegal. Though they soon tried to, once they realised what I was doing. Did you ever get into trouble for your actions? <laughs> yes, once or twice. In 1976, they put me in jail for cutting down some pine trees to allow me to build a fence to keep out the cats and foxes. How did you get out of that situation? Well, I signed an agreement saying that I wouldn't go on building the sanctuary, but then I just kept on building it. That was very brave of you. <laughs> well, I figured that I had signed under duress, so I didn't feel bound by it. The sanctuary was completed in 1983 and opened to the public in 1985, and within a year it was overrun with native animals. Uh, there are 
other ways of protecting endangered animals, though, aren't there? You can raise public awareness through research and educational programs. Well, I don't have much time for that. Unfortunately, today we measure success in science, not by your results, but by how much funding you get. What you've done is obviously admirable. But don't you think there's an argument for letting nature take its course? I mean, don't you think cats and foxes have a right to live too? Well, no, not really. They were introduced to this country, but they don't belong here. But aren't you trying to turn back the clock? These other animals are here now. What is so important to you about native species that justifies killing any number of alien ones? I believe that evolution gave us a paradise, and that we will lose everything unless we understand the need for balance. But really, at the end of the day, it's just a belief. It's just a feeling. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a conversation between Fred and Liz. They are talking about sleep and dreams. As you listen, answer the questions by writing no more than three words for each answer. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello Fred, you don't look so good. What's the matter? I just didn't have a good sleep. It seemed I dreamed all night. Do you dream a lot when you sleep? Yes, in fact everybody dreams and everybody needs to dream in order to stay healthy. There are two kinds of sleep, active sleep and passive sleep. The passive sleep gives our body the rest that is needed and prepares us for active sleep in which dreaming occurs. The dream stage is very important in our sleep cycle. When the person is dreaming, the eyes begin to move. Through the night, people alternate between passive and active sleep. The cycle is repeated several times throughout the night. Do you know how long people usually dream during eight-hour sleep? For about one and a half hours on average. So we need active sleep because dreaming helps us to rest our minds. I see. All people experience dream cycles. Can you remember dreams? What did you dream last night? Oh yes, it was terrible. I dreamed that I was chased by someone or something. I don't remember very well. So I was running all the time. This is a very common type of dream. Over 70% of people have dreamed that they were being chased or pursued by something, and often in the dream they find themselves unable to flee for one reason or another. These often occur during periods of great anxiety and may be related to frustrating situations which are frequently occurring in their waking life. Anxiety dreams are amongst the most common types reported and are particularly common amongst women, 78%. Only 63% of men experience them. How about dreams of violence? Dreams featuring scenes of violence are much more common amongst men, 50%, than amongst women, 44%. The differences are not very great. Perhaps men are simply more likely to talk about violent things, and it must be remembered that women are often the most ardent fans of TV westerns and wrestling programs. Are there any more kinds of dreams that men experience more than women? Yes. When people are tight in finances, they often have dreams which involved finding coins, showering from a slot machine, or picking up money from the ground. About a quarter of men have had this kind of dream, but only 15% of women. This probably relates to the fact that, that money matters are more likely to preoccupy the male than the female. Do you sometimes have dreams about falling? 
Yes, it is a common type of dream too. Dreams about falling are very common, with about 75% scoring average. The most frequently reported is one in which typically one trips over something, stumbles or falls, and wakes up with a jump. How do you explain this? Psychologists now believe that these dreams do not have any great emotional significance, but are merely due to muscular spasms, which take place on the threshold between consciousness and sleep. Well, dreams about flying or floating in the air are often considered to be related to an unconscious wish to escape from something. They are, in fact, reported by about 50% of dreamers. Dreams about the sea are also common. Women, 40%. Are far more likely to experience than men, 27 percent. What other kinds of dreams women experience more than men? Dreams about famous people. Women are more likely to dream about famous people, politicians, pop stars, film stars, and the like, 33 percent than men, 27 percent. One very common dream, which almost certainly falls into the wish fulfillment category, is when people report that they are actually meeting famous people in their dreams. What do you think of the recurring dreams? Recurring dreams are very common too. Seventy percent of people reporting them on an average. In most cases, recurring dreams are of a vaguely unpleasant kind, and are almost certainly caused because the individual has a problem of a significant kind, which he is unable to resolve in his waking life. The solving of this problem almost always leads to the disappearance of the recurring dream. Women are more likely to have recurring dreams than men. That's so interesting. Well, what causes people to have bizarre dreams, such as dreams about the loss of teeth? Oh, some psychologists believe that it's a memory dream, referring back to that significant period in your baby life when your teeth fell out. Another explanation is that you are suffering from low-level toothache, which is not enough to get through to the conscious mind, but which trickles through into your dreams. Do you believe that dreams about the future will come true? Well, dreams about the future, which come true, are very frequently reported. Though it is fair to say that scientists are very doubtful about whether these are simply coincidence or genuine peeps into the future. Almost 30% of people believe that they have had at least one such dream. That's so instructive. You are an expert in this field, Liz. How do you know so much about dreams? Don't you remember that I'm majoring in psychology? I have done some research on the topic sleep and dreams. Thank you so much. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.